Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Welcome to Ruckus, that weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day of the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics tonight. The Jeff Roller Coaster, a chip off the old block grant in Kansas, and Visit KC says indeed, lots of people do visit KC. But we start with our Newsmaker segment and talk about an issue of concern that transcends state line, and that is the state of our nation's health. A new report shows an overall decline in the health of the American people with significant problems in both Missouri and Kansas. Healthy KC is a health and wellness initiative designed to try and turn things around. It's an effort of the Chamber of Commerce, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and numerous other groups and organizations in the metro area. And here to talk about the program is Dr. Bridget McCandless with the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. There was a news conference this morning, Thursday morning, for folks who watched the program on Sunday to talk about this program and to introduce it to the media and to the public. Talk a bit about what the program involves and what was said this morning. You know, we've talked about health for a long time and we've really certainly come to the place where we realize other people can't do it for us. So Kansas City has to decide that it wants to be a healthier and better place. And so it was an opportunity for the chamber to bring a lot of folks together around the table, business, uh, community leaders, neighborhood leaders, people working in health to think about where we could be if we gave ourselves the opportunity to do that. So it's been a great undertaking. And the initiative is divided into several different sections, is it not? It is. So we had a lot of discussion about where we thought the most impact that this group could have. And we ended up with five different categories. So healthy eating, active living, tobacco, behavioral health, and workplace wellness were the five categories we settled on. Let's talk about tobacco. Uh, you can, on the one hand, say people should quit smoking. But on the other hand, you can say you've got to raise taxes on the price of cigarettes, packages of cigarettes to discourage people from smoking. And you want to see an effort to raise the sales tax on cigarettes in both Missouri and Kansas? We do. We know that um, the number of people smoking has gone down over time, but not nearly as much in Missouri as it has across the nation. Part of the reason is Kansas City, or Missouri rather, has the lowest tobacco tax in the nation. We're number 51. We only tax our cigarettes at 17 cents a pack. And so we know that price is one of the big things that keeps teenagers from starting or keeps them from smoking more doesn't always work for people who have been 50-year smokers who are a two-pack a day. They may make the choice to smoke fewer cigarettes, but the real bang for the buck from health comes from getting kids not to start. And you're not excited about the electronic cigarettes either, are you? You know, I think that there's a lot to be learned about what the health impact of those are. I'm extremely concerned that they're being targeted at kids and it's, it's a gateway to being reliant on nicotine and we think that that probably will increase the rate of smoking later. I mentioned the national health rankings as we were starting our conversation, and uh, Kansas was number 27, Missouri 36. Is there something unique about the Midwest that causes these two states to rank relatively low in health numbers? Well, the sad part is we didn't used to be there, and we've been sliding in our health rankings over the last 25 years. Part of it's smoking, part of it's inactivity, part of it's our choices around investing in access for health care for people. Neither Missouri nor Kansas was a state that chose to expand Medicaid. So there's a lot of people who don't have the option of preventive care, counseling on nutrition and exercise. Um, so I think all of those things are part of the reason we're so low. Healthy Kansas City is going to lobby for a Medicaid expansion in both Missouri and Kansas? Certainly the Chamber has chosen Medicaid expansion as one of their biggest initiatives, uh, both for the health impact but also for the financial impact for both states. It brings a lot of federal dollars in to allow us to both support the hospitals in rural and urban areas as well as make sure that people have the option for uh, getting care when they need it. How will we know if Kansas City's health is improving? Always a hard question. Um, you can look at health metrics for disease states, so heart disease and cancer and diabetes, but you can also look at activity levels, 
how many people are smoking, what are they drinking, what do they count as their mental health days, whether they're good days or bad days. So I think that there's lots of different ways you can measure it. One of the things about the Chambers Initiative is that they tried to put some really concrete objectives around those that they could measure. What about the race to the moon? Can you explain I, that briefly? Sure. I love this idea. So this is just to get people out to do collective activity. And it's nothing fancier than a pair of tennis shoes and a pedometer way to count your steps. And it's a billion steps to the moon and back. And I know that Kansas City can do that. And we're going to look at challenging another Midwest city to see who can get there first. And finally, when I was a little kid, I used to hear adults, my parents say, when you've got your health, you've got everything. And as you grow older, you realize how true that is. Absolutely, but we also know that it takes a lifetime. The great news is it can always get better. So small steps make great changes, and even if people make some small um, improvements in their health, it pays off big. We'll keep track of this. Thank you very much for coming in. A pleasure to meet you this morning. Thank you very much. That's Dr. Bridget McCandless with the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City. Now let's meet the Ruckettes and start a ruckus. John Stevens is president of Rock Hill Strategic. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Lisa Johnston is a political consultant and was the Kansas Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate in 2010. And attorney Steve Marakian is with the law firm of Worsh, Hobbs & Marakian. Well, despite law enforcement's conclusion that there is no apparent discernible connection between a negative radio commercial and the suicide of former Missouri State Auditor and Republican gubernatorial candidate Tom Schweik, the speculation continues. The radio commercial that aired just days before Schweik's death, a takeoff on the popular Netflix series House of Cards, has been linked to Axiom Strategies, the firm run by controversial Kansas City consultant Jeff Rowe, an occasional panelist on Ruckus. Rowe is refusing to talk with the Kansas City Star about the commercial or his work with the organization that paid for it. Some candidates being consulted by Rowe are also not talking to the paper about their relationships with him. Among them, Missouri GOP gubernatorial hopeful Catherine Hannaway. Given the criticism Rowe has received from the Star over the years for his work and the acknowledged liberal slant of the paper's editorial page, should they, Steve? You know, I, I don't know whether they should or shouldn't. I, 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 what, what troubles me about this whole issue with, with, the, with Roe is that <clears throat> a couple of significant points. None of us know at this point, and I think it's somewhat irresponsible for editorial writers or columnists to write things which, which suggest that Mr. Schweik committed suicide because of an ad or an ad campaign and implicitly linking Jeff Rowe to that. I don't know, but I'm not going to make that leap, okay? And I think it's irresponsible. There are larger issues with the Roe situation, and, and those go to the sort of the fundamental issues of how we run campaigns in this country. It's one thing to say everybody does it. Democrats, Republicans, they run dirty campaigns all around the country. The Republicans ran one of the dirtiest campaigns in history against one of their own down in Mississippi, okay? There are awful campaigns. To excuse it and say, well, everybody does it, therefore it's okay, I think this is the point. We need to have a better atmosphere within the entire political arena. So am I going to sit here and attack Jeff Rowe and say he's a horrible person? No. I'm just saying there are things that he needs to look at himself and his candidates who choose him need to be careful and run high-level uh, moral campaigns. I, I want to go to Gwen here in a second, but first, Lisa, you are in the political consulting business to some extent. Uh, the client makes the final decision is that not true? Not the consultant. The consultant doesn't say, you will run this regardless. The client decides. Ideally, the, the candidate can decides. Ideally, the candidate should always be making the final call. Now, obviously, some candidates are more malleable than others in terms of the influence. Now, this particular ad was a third party ad, and so it was in a, a bit of a different arena. And one of, one of the things that I think that we need to be talking about, because I agree in principle with what Steve was saying, that there's so much negativity, we need to set a higher bar, but we also need to look at why these ads are taking place. And it's largely because we have so many disengaged, low information voters, and this is what campaigns and consultants think they need to do to get people's attention these days. Another well-known consultant who periodically is on ruckus, Steve Glorioso, known for his gentleness of tone, uh, commented about this on uh, 41 Action News this week. My jaw dropped. I mean, it did when I heard Tom Schweik commit, committed suicide. But on this one, 
I, I, I just, I didn't know what to think. I, was, I still don't know what to think. There's a lot of room in there to run ugly campaigns and attack people for their motives and their positions. But this is a whole new low. Gwen, do you think uh, Jeff Rowe and his clients should have talked to the Kansas City Star about this? No, I don't see any advantage in them for talking to the star about it, uh, whether or not the star was, leans to the left or the right. I think when you get into this type of a situation, and you, uh, it's, it would not have been uh, productive because the st talking to the star was probably not going to change the, uh, the slant that they were going to put on the story because they've already made that clear. So I think it's wise for them to, to uh, be silent. I, I agree with, with Steve in talking about the political climate. But the bottom line is, you know, these types of ads work because voters are not get, uh, you know, educating themselves on the important issues in these campaigns. And they look at these ads and they form these opinions and that's why they keep doing them. And uh, that's why they're successful. We don't know why Swipe committed suicide, and I agree with Steve, to, to, to try to arrive at any, uh, you know, to speculate on the fact that he did it because of Rose's ads, which I think were horrible, and uh, that ads should not personally attack people. They should really focus in on the issues, and, and folks should need, you know, we need to do a better job of holding them accountable when they don't. Uh, but we don't know why he, he chose a permanent solution to a temporary problem. That's what we know about suicide. Well, so beyond that, to say that it's Jeff Rowe's fault and he shouldn't do that, I well, think is, is, is not a good Here's what former Ruckett, Gail Abohaka, wrote this week. Uh, he thinks Rowe and his clients should be punished, John. He says voters can send them a message and it's pretty simple. Say no at the ballot box. If Rowe's clients start losing more, his reputation will suffer. Do you think that's going to happen? Perhaps, but I, I think the bigger issue and the bigger discussion that needs to be taking place is uh, not about what the motivations for what occurred. I, and, and, and beyond that, do even with the politics and do these type of uh, ads work, I think the bigger issue is the, the anonymity of some of these third party things. It, it, pulls the candidate out of being accountable for these issues. And I think that's a bigger issue that we really should be focusing on. All right, aside from death and taxes, I think Kansans can be assured of a third thing. Unending, torturous debate over how much to spend for education and how the money is divided. The school finance formula is always confusing and chaotic. There always seems to be a case pending before the state Supreme Court over how to interpret this sentence in the Constitution. The legislature shall make suitable provision for finance of the educational interest of the state. Simple. The legislature and the governor just tossed out the most recent formula and have approved block grants to the state's districts. Under that system, the state sends a specific amount of money to each district, and then each district decides how to spend it. This, too, is now being challenged in court by the KCK School District. Now, Lisa, you've been an educator and you've done some edu educating in Kansas. Do you think this battle will ever come to an end? I think this will be an ongoing debate uh, into the future. Now, this is a particularly contentious time given that not only are we debating education funding, but we're doing so in the midst of a revenue crisis. And I think it's rather unfortunate that the legislature chose to dispense with the old formula without a solid plan for moving forward. The block grant approach is really a stopgap measure, and some districts are going to fare better than others under this. And we've seen examples from across the state with some districts reporting it's going to be uh, a real hardship and others saying, well, well, this uh, combined with our local but, option but budget that, allows... But isn't that true with any system, any finance formula, any way of distributing the money? Some districts will love it and some districts will say it's not enough. Well, that's true, but... Well, they'll I, all say it's not enough. I mean, there will always be critics of any approach. That is absolutely true. But I think that we need to do our due diligence and ensure that we are creating an approach and a system mm -hmm. that will be beneficial for as many districts as, as possible and, and not create an imbalance of winners and losers. Well, you know, over here, it, it seems like no matter what plan is presented and adopted by the legislature and signed by the governor, it goes to court. And that goes on for months and years. Yeah, that, that's one of, the huge, one of the huge problems that I think we have in Kansas right now, is that this is dragging on and there's no clear uh, conclusion. And, and I think what it's leading to and what you're seeing coming out of Topeka is 
not just the financing formula, but also sort of a general tone of hostility, I think, towards educators in Kansas, which I think is, is very troubling. Educators have a form of hostility toward the governor, too, do they not? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Gwen, have you ever met a school administrator? And I know you deal with schools quite a bit. You were very interested in what went on in the Kansas City, Missouri district. Ever met an administrator who said his district or his institution had enough money? <laughs> no, but I think this issue is, is really uh, much deeper than that. It's, it's an issue of the equitable allocation of resources across those districts. And when you get into this block grant uh, process, then the issues of equity ca are, are called into question. And I think that the legislature, legislature should have worked harder to come up with the funding formula that that uh, equitably distributes the state revenues across all districts. If you look at Wyandotte County in a block grant situation, those that there's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. But, but can you define equity in these no. circumstances? And that's why Steve? I, 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 I tend to disagree with with what's been said here. Um, I'm glad they scrapped the formula. They don't have time to spend the next 10 years developing a new formula. The problem we have in Kansas, aside from the revenue issues which relate to this, is that. <clears throat> We, we've, we've created a circumstance, and I think in large, large measure the courts are responsible for creating the circumstance, where, where the courts have determined that it's their job to determine how the money is spent. That's not what our Constitution says. That's not what Kansas law says. And what we need to have is a situation where everybody understands you're not going to have exactly the same dollars in Garden City as you are in Olathe, Kansas. It's not going to happen. Steve Rose nailed it with his article last week, okay? Things like local option, property taxes, block grants, because there is no such thing in this world as saying that in the state of Kansas, we're going to have $4 billion and we're going to divide it equally among all school districts and assume that's going to work. Lisa, is it possible we have too many school districts in Kansas, yes. a state where the population is what, about, I'm not even sure what the population is, but there are 309 school districts? I think that that is certainly an issue that needs to be carefully examined. Now, we don't want to eliminate rural schools or bus children, you know, we for long distances, them? but there may be some opportunities for consolidation and provided that it doesn't damage the community or the educational opportunities for the children, I think that those well, opportunities should be examined. I live in Kansas City, Kansas, Wyandotte County. I think the population's 150,000 maybe. We have three, at least three yeah. school districts. Does that seem essential? I live in the Turner District. Uh, it used to be a small town within Wyandotte County. It's now part of Kansas City, Kansas, has its own individual school district. Final question, Steve. In a battle between the legislature and the state Supreme Court over who gets the final word on how much money is spent, who's going to win? Well, I believe, I trust our judges in the Supreme Court to ultimately do the right thing. They're going to have to stand down. It is not their job to tell the legislature how to allocate the funds or to develop this formula. And so by scrapping the formula, which was the good first, best first step, all the court should be looking at is, is the legislature making suitable provision? The court should not be telling the legislature, here's how you distribute the funds. <laughs> and let's define suitable provision. Well, That's really exactly. easy to do. Yeah. But they That's don't, the challenge, they don't right. get to I, say, you must allocate $5 billion. I, it's I, not up to them. I met one school official, former Kansas City, Missouri school superintendent, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Anthony Amato, who said the district had enough money. And he got fired a short time later. <laughs> a few months ago on Ruckus, I talked with Ronnie Burt, president and CEO of Visit KC, the organization that works to promote conventions and tourism. Although he was new to his job, Burt was enthusiastic about Kansas City's future. And judging from figures recently released, he had good reason to be. In 2014, the city recorded its highest hotel occupancy rate in 17 years and booked more meetings than any time in the past 10. Of course, 2014 saw Kansas City hosting playoff and World Series games, something that doesn't happen every year. So, John, was 2014 a fluke, or is there a new normal for Kansas City as a tourism and convention mecca? Well, first, being you know a loyal Royals fan, what's to say it's it not could annual? It could happen. <laughs> I'm saying historically it hasn't happened every year. <laughs> sure. No, in reality, it certainly is not a fluke. 
but we, we have to realize that this wave of tourism and, and wave of attention in Kansas City is fragile that we are riding a recovery wave of tourism in Kansas City and nationwide. Uh, and Kansas City is gaining ground uh, nationwide, but we, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we still uh, struggle with a lot of things, and, and we need to look, I think, as we make planned investments that benefit residents and tourists alike, we need to, we need to make some conscious planned investments uh, to preserve the growth for the future. Like a downtown hotel, partly financed by taxpayers? I think certainly like a downtown hotel, but it has to be the right investment. Well, if we're getting all these conventions and meetings in Kansas City, Gwen, uh, apparently the hotel rooms are sufficient for those folks. Why do we need another thousand rooms? Well, you know, I agree that they probably we do need another hotel. I just I'm concerned about how you finance it. I, mm -hmm. I yes. don't think it should be financed with tax dollars at all. And so, you know, if we're generating the, these um, these bookings here in Kansas City, it's outstanding. I think I commend the um, uh, Visit KC team for all of the success that they're that they've achieved. I would love to see a downtown hotel. I think the streetcar running up and down Main adds to that. That's that's nice. That's the the tourist attraction, but it needs to su support itself. Is a streetcar system a tourist attraction? Do people come to Kansas <laughs> City to ride the streetcars? No, it's not necessarily. It's an amenity. It for I mean, it's for the citizenry. It's not for. Mm -hmm. Tourist, is it? I, I think that's what uh, that's one of the challenges that we face. Is a lot of people think that investments in downtown, for instance, are mutually exclusive. That it's either for tourists or for for residents yeah. and office workers, and it's not. We we went from five years ago, Kansas City among convention goers, the downtown was rated as one of the worst in America. It's rated as one of the number one amenities for Kansas City now. So it does show that planned investments benefit residents. The the apartment growth downtown, the new resident growth, is. Uh, I would say at a 25 plus year high. Lisa, the Kansas City Star reported that uh, Kansas City shows up on a lot of best of lists for mm -hmm. food, millennials, technology, and other measurements. Is that important? It is, and I agree with the toast that one of our panelists, Woody Kozad, gave several weeks ago when he said that for a city of our size, we have a tremendous amount to offer. And in addition to that, we're very economical compared to a lot of other destinations in the United States. And so I think Kansas City is a very attractive place. Steve, you travel quite a bit. Uh, what do people in other parts of this country not know about Kansas City? They tend to view Kansas City as being essentially a backwater they, they don't know about our sports teams. They, they know virtually nothing about the cultural and uh, like the Kauffman Center. We, we, we host people all the time who come from foreign countries who live at Fort Leavenworth. They're astounded by the Nelson, by the Kauffman Center, uh, by the parks, the, the plaza. These, nobody knows outside of Kansas City. And if, if you talk to people in St. Louis, they view us like we're Tonganoxie, and, and, and it's and too bad. Visit Kansas City has resurrected its film, good verb to use this week, has resurrected its film office. Is, is that important? Is that going to help Kansas City attract business, well, attract tourists? Certainly, it's a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I was very proud to, to have played a role in, yeah. in that, and, and uh, I think that plays a role. And then additionally, the awareness of Kansas City. We really are changing the perceptions nationally and internationally of KC. There's still a lot of work to do. We need more marketing dollars, and 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 those you know those national rankings don't just magically appear. It takes a lot of work from a lot and, of people. And quickly, uh, I don't know him well, but I just interviewed Ronnie Bird. He seems like a pretty uh, dynamic guy. Yeah. No, great addition, great addition to visit KC and to the to the leadership of Kansas City. All right, it's time now for roast and toast, where the ruck gets cheer or jeer, people and events in the news. And so let us start tonight with Steve Marakian. My roast is for Apple CEO Tim Cook for his hysterical and hypocritical rant against the new Indiana religious freedom law. Whether the act is good law or good policy is not clear. What is clear is this. The law does not overtly discriminate against gays any more than the similar law in Illinois that was sponsored by Barack Obama or the federal RIFRA that was passed under Bill Clinton with unanimous Democratic Party support. Mr. Cook, instead of your intolerant attack on Christians for supposed intolerance of gays, how about you shut up and stop selling iPads in countries that kill people simply for being gay? That is actual discrimination worth fighting. Right, Gwen. Okay. 
Well, I'm, I'm roasting uh, Councilman Ed Ford for using his power as committee chair to stifle the democratic process during yesterday's hearings on an ordinance to raise the minimum wage. There was a motion to pass the ordinance forward to the council for consideration, but Ford unilaterally ta tabled the issue in spite of the urgings of committee members and uh, numerous proponents, including civil rights and religious leaders, whose constituencies had overwhelmingly supported Ford's election to the city council. Instead of allowing an upper down vote on this issue, Ford tabled the issue and did not allow the democratic process to go forward to the city council for consideration. Shame on you, Councilman Ford. Lisa? I have a toast for statistician Beth Clarkson, who recently filed suit to obtain paper <coughs> substantiating documents of electronic voting records, given her initial analysis that showed that a statistically greater percentage of ballots were cast for Republican candidates as precinct sizes increase. We need to ensure that our electronic voting machines are working properly in Kansas, and I look forward to Secretary of State Chris Kobach enthusiastically supporting this effort, given his professed desire to eliminate voter fraud. My toast is to the Kansas City creative community. Uh, as we conclude another successful design week, uh, I think it's important that we look at Kansas City as truly as America's creative crossroads. And the creativity and design is the uh, foundation and future of Kansas City. From architects that design the majority of stadiums throughout the world, to advertising agencies, to artists and musicians who raise the profile of Kansas City. It's exciting to see that and it's exciting for the growth of Kansas City. All right, and finally, my annual toast to the Truman Good Neighbor Award Foundation, set to commemorate President Harry Truman's 131st birthday on May the 11th at the downtown Marriott Muehlbach Hotels. The award recipient this year, Lisa, you'll be happy to know, is a Democrat, former New Mexico governor, <laughs> former Secretary of Energy, and former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Bill Richardson. As I noted, this recipient is a Democrat, as were the last two before him. But I can assure you from personal experience, Republicans are indeed welcome, and they will enjoy the event. Details available at on, uh, online at trumanaward.org, trumanaward.org. And that is Ruckus for this week, back next Thursday at 7. Now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the crew, Mike Shannon saying have a happy Easter, happy Passover. Thanks for joining us and good night.